October 16, 1950, engine number 11 whistled out of Elizabethton, Tennessee. The melancholy of a last run darkened the glory of a warm, bright Appalachian morning. As the tiny Baldwin 10-wheeler retraced the route traveled so many times before, she was turning the last page in the history of narrow gauge railroading in the Blue Ridge. She was leaving behind a legacy of service to her neighbors, to whom she was a part of the family, a trusting and reliable link to the outside. Tears would mark the passing of the beloved narrow gauge, but our purpose here is not to mourn, but to shake the grates in the firebox of our memories, to watch the phoenix arise from the ashes. Yes, in these remarkable films, we stir the reflections and echoes of the long-vanished trains in Doe River Gorge, on State Line Hill, and the lush valleys into Cranberry. The East Tennessee and Western North Carolina, a long name for a short road, ran from Johnson City, Tennessee to Cranberry, North Carolina. It was chartered and constructed to three-foot gauge in the early 1880s to haul high-grade iron ore from the mines at Cranberry to interchanges with the trunk lines at Johnson City. The line ran northeast to Elizabethton, later to become the business center to sustain the ET and WNC when the narrow gauge became unprofitable. A third rail to standard gauge was added on this segment in the early years of this century. From Elizabethton, the line turns toward the southeast and parallels the Doe River nearly to North Carolina. This is rugged country, particularly in the gorge carved by the Doe River between Hampton and Blevins. Sharp curves, steep grades, bridges, and five tunnels mark this segment of the line. The gorge is wild and beautiful. Palisades rise hundreds of feet above the river and the railroad was built on ledges blasted from solid rock. After leaving the gorge, the road passes a series of small communities as it digs in for the 4% grades up State Line Hill. After slipping across the border into North Carolina, the tracks turn southward and reach their destination at Cranberry, 35 miles from Johnson City. Other lines tapped into the ET and WNC's success. In particular, the Linville River Railway was constructed from a connection at Cranberry, 12 miles south to Pinola for lumber traffic from a W.M. Ritter sawmill. The ET purchased the Linville River in 1913, improved, then extended the tracks north to Shell's Mills to gain the business of another sawmill. In 1919, the final extent was made to Boone, 66 miles from Johnson City. The two lines operated to a common timetable and for all practical purposes were one as the ET. In 1940, however, heavy flooding from a hurricane seriously damaged the Linville River. The cost to repair was beyond economic reason and the ICC authorized abandonment beyond Cranberry. The ET was back to its original configuration. Passenger service ended in 1940 as the viability of the narrow gauge waned. However, with the coming of the war, new life was breathed into the little line. The war board reinstituted passenger service between Cranberry and Elizabethton to carry ship workers to the bustling defense plants. Peace quickly brought an end to this service, and the narrow gauge was able to hold on only five more years. But the Tweetsie was still busy when these films were shot. So let's go back to the war years of the East Tennessee and Western North Carolina Railroad. We begin at the western terminus of the railroad in Johnson City. The year is 1942, and we see that the company also has a trucking operation. As a matter of fact, it has developed one of the earliest trailer-on flat car services. The railroad has been dual-gauged as far as Elizabethton for many years. Coal and other bulk loads were transferred between gauges on the trestle to the left. Boxcar loads were handled in the shed to the right. Number 11 sports a red stack and well-maintained running gear. A brakeman makes a hitch with boxcar 441 while working Johnson City Yard. Harris Manufacturing, a large flooring mill, forms the background for 10-wheeler number 11, switching standard gauge cars. 
a feat possible due to patented swivel couplers. From near the yard office, the Eleven continues her chores. The ET interchanged in Johnson City with both the Southern and Clinchfield, providing its connections with the outside world. Motor car number one poses in front of idle Laconia passenger cars. Number one was one of two maintenance vehicles constructed by chief mechanic Clarence Hobbs. Tiny number 11 is working for all she's worth, shoving four cars up the bulk transfer incline. The car's contents will be dumped into narrow gauge cars. ET was unique in the fact that, though dual gauged for decades, it used only narrow gauge motive power until 1939. The switching is done. We'll tie on to the caboose and be on our way. We ride the rear platform of the caboose as the train travels the dual gauge iron from Johnson City to Elizabethton. The tracks run through the flats along the Watauga River. The tender is topped off at the Bemberg water tank, just west of Elizabethton. From this point, standard gauge rails ran into the Bemberg rayon plant. The narrow gauge rail had been removed after the purchase of number 204 in 1939 and the 205 in 1940. Here we see number 205, a former Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac switcher built in 1906. We leave the 205 at the tank in Elizabethton and pass the now idle depot. The view is from the caboose as we proceed east from Elizabethton toward Valley Forge. Dual gauge iron once ran all the way to Hampton, but now only narrow gauge rails remain beyond coal chute. Engines must now take coal at Johnson City. The train crosses the Valley Forge Bridge. We look down on the Valley Forge community and the Doe River. The train crosses a covered deck bridge. Then enters the first of five tunnels. Tunnel number one was cut on a curve.
Just beyond the community of Hampton, the rails cross the Little Doe River on a covered blue trust bridge. Just ahead is the west entrance to the Doe River Gorge. We pass the community of Hampton down in the valley. The locomotive is starting to struggle against the grade. thousand feet above us. The roadbed has been blasted from the sheer rock walls. Retaining walls keep it from crashing into the rushing Doe River, nearly a hundred feet below. The train pauses at Pardee Point, the only level spot in Doe River Gorge. This was a favorite place to admire the raw beauty of the area. Engineer Sherman Pippin and conductor George Q. Williams react for the camera. Engineer Pippin had been oiling around the awesome beauty of the gorge can only begin to be appreciated on film. The cameraman walks ahead of it from the point to catch the train snaking through a cut. grade and sharp curves. Deep in the gorge, far from the view of their supervisors, the train now allowed the guest photographers onto the locomotive. Shooting ahead, they are positioned near the injector alongside the boiler. A nice warm spot in the middle. Continuing up the gorge, the train crosses a deck bridge, then plunges into tunnel number four. continues to climb above Tunnel 5. Continuing up the gorge, we cross the bridge at Blevins. The scenery is still beautiful as we pass cuts between Blevins and White Rock. This view from the locomotive is near the east end of the gorge. The train passes through Little Man's Cut.
Then Big Nan's cut. You can lead a horse to water. The fireman replenishes the tender at Doherty Tank, near Crabtree. Engineer Sherman Pippin continues to lavish care on his 10-wheeler. The train then continues up the valley toward North Carolina. Number 11 has reached Shell Creek, Tennessee. There are a couple of boxcars to switch. We get some good close-ups of the locomotive at work. The brakeman swings onto a gondola as switching activity continues. We are now in North Carolina and past the Elk Park Depot. Our destination, Cranberry. We look down at cars in the lower yard. Cranberry Depot is still wearing the E.T. standard green paint with red trim. The beauty of summer in Cranberry, North Carolina. We're heading west. The engine crosses Cranberry Creek. We tie onto a gondola in the upper yard in Cranberry. We stay behind to watch the loco as it moves down the switchback to the lower yard. The brakeman bends the iron in Cranberry Yard. Then, the train is back toward the depot. If you promise not to tell the super, we'll tell you that the guy in the boxcar is not a member of the crew. This brakeman, too, is not on the roster. The locomotive passes the upper yard in Cranberry. The lush ground cover engulfs the rails leading to the unused Cranberry engine house. The train continues down State Line Hill. It is west of Elk Park and heading for Shell Creek.
west of Shell Creek and nearing Roan Mountain. Back through Big Nance Cut, just east of Blevins. This house at Blevins Bridge was probably once dependent on the railroad for transportation to Johnson City. The train rumbles through the east end of Doe River Gorge after passing Blevins. We cross the Doe River on a food truss bridge, then plunge into Tunnel 4. We're deep in the gorge, approaching Pardee Point. After passing through Tunnel 1, the cameraman looks down on the old highway bridge. This is the final leg back to Elizabeth. This sequence has represented a typical day for the E.T. narrow gauge in 1942. Jump ahead to 1943. These scenes do not necessarily represent a continuous train, but give us a good image of the Tweetsie's mid-war operations. Three parallel bridges span the Doe River at Hampton. One is the new highway span. The E.T.'s covered deck bridge, in green, is in the center. The rear bridge is the old highway bridge. This long freight is helping to do in the narrow gauge. Most of the loads are construction material for highway projects. The engine labors against the four plus percent grade on State Line Hill. The cameraman rides in a hopper loaded with gravel for the highway department. We're between Shell Creek and Elk Park. We're riding on the diamonds. The fireman works hard to keep the steam up and the cameraman on his toes, while the engineer, well, the engineer enjoys the scenery. The Baldwin 10-wheeler has been through this all before, all in a day's work. The crew can relax a little, knowing they're in the middle of nowhere. The battle is won once more. As the train reaches the summit, the engineer backs off the throttle and the pop lifts. We're into North Carolina and the locomotive eases into Cranberry.
While the crew switches a gondola in Upper Cranberry Yard, the conductor takes the path down to the depot and the lower yard where he'll wait for the engine. The cameraman remains at the main line in the upper yard as the locomotive backs down the switchback to the lower yard. We've dropped down the hill to the lower yard. The brakeman lines the switch for the lead to the lower yard. The engineer eases the number 11 back to the depot. The large number on the tender defines the time period since this dial lasted from 1943 to 1946. The iron ore mines at Cranberry had been closed for 15 years, and traffic now consisted mainly of gravel for the North Carolina Highway Department and a little lumber. The crew busies itself shuffling cars. The traffic seems to give an air of prosperity. The entire valley around the depot once teemed with the activity of the iron mines and furnaces. The steel was cool grade and was in high demand. Rail fan Jack Alexander walks the roofs of the boxcars while the train is standing. The locomotive has returned to the upper yard and kicks three hoppers into a siding. The engine then runs around the train. The furnace at Cranberry was abandoned in 1902 when more efficient furnaces became available near Johnson City. These wooden hoppers were originally used to haul the iron ore from Cranberry to Johnson City. The camera is atop the tank as the fireman takes on water at Cranberry. Number nine is at Cranberry with a wartime passenger train. Number 11 is turning its passenger train. A brakeman hurries to set the Y switch for the forward move. This is wartime, and the ET and WNC has been mandated to resume passenger service, which had been abandoned three years before. In fact, the trains ran essentially around the clock to serve all shifts at the defense plants in Benbury, which manufactured rayon parachutes for the war effort. The train ties on to a couple of boxcars and a caboose, making this a mix out of Cranberry. The mixed heads west. The boxcars and caboose will probably be dropped at Elk Park to be picked up later by a freight.
Number 11 with a combine car pauses at Elk Park. Our rail fan friends earn their fares by assisting the firemen to move up coal in the tender and by polishing the brass bell. Perhaps there was a new meal to be had at the Royal Cafe across from the depot. The train pauses at Shell Creek to pick up defense workers heading to their jobs in Benburg. We continue west. Conductor Lum Johnson demonstrates a sequence of hand signals. One would think that these are a pre-radio system for crew communication. However, it more likely is an example of the hokum and sleight of hand that helped to perpetuate the legend of the Tweetsie as a quaint mountain railroad. The train has passed through Tunnel 1 and emerges onto the covered deck bridge west of Hampton. The Bemberg Depot had its name changed during the war to the more patriotic, less German-sounding Port Rayon. This depot was added in the late 20s when the large rayon plants were built. Since the commuter trains terminated at Port Rayon, a Y was installed in December 1942. A train is moved around the Y. The facility was quickly removed just a few days after VE Day in May of 1945. Combine number 15 is behind the tender as the train takes water from the Benberg tank. The engineer oils around while waiting for the ship change at the rayon plants. The ET and WNC schedule allowed passengers to get to work before their ship. This allowed the train to be turned water and cold and still be ready to go as the ship coming off duty arrived at the depot. The schedule also allowed for the transport of local high school kids. Number nine, running light, has arrived westbound at Elizabethton and waits in the clear as the passenger train approaches the depot.
This eastbound is approaching Hampton after passing Tunnel 1. Much of the countryside served by the Tutsi was rugged and isolated, but very beautiful. Cameraman Vince Ryan leans out of combine car number 15 as the three-car train comes down State Line Hill. Engine number 12 drifts down State Line Hill. How many of us would show up for the opportunity to duplicate this ride today? Gold paint is still visible as number 12 switches a lumber yard at Rome Mountain. After leaving Roan Mountain, the freight heads down toward the Doe River Gorge. Once in the gorge, it crosses a through truss bridge, through tunnel number four, and across an iron deck bridge. It passes Pardee Point, the most famous location on the railroad. Here, the track is nearly 80 feet above the river. Once through the gorge, the freight rumbles down through the valley to Hampton, passing through the covered bridge over the Little Doe River. Then it crosses the covered deck bridge, then west through Valley Forge, and into Elizabetta.
The train runs past photographer Jack Alexander as it winds through rock cuts at Blevins. This is the Doherty tank, just below Crabtree. It had been moved from White Rock. A brakeman returns to the engine. Little ten wheelers could lay a good coat of cinders, keeping the caboose broom busy. These long trains belie the financial difficulties faced by the narrow gauge. The train makes its way through the gorge downgrade past Hardy Point. Number 11 turns its three-car train on the Cranberry Y. Passenger cars numbers 22, 24, and 25 were built by the Laconia Car Works for commuter service on the Boston and Deerfield Beach Lane. The ET bought them used in the 20s. The train heads downhill into the gorge as a section crew pauses to watch. It passes Party Point, moves along a ledge cut from the mountain and shored up by a retaining wall. Then it enters tunnel number three. passenger train departs Elizabethton. In a few years, the narrow gauge would be gone, but there are more than memories left, however. The standard gauge still operates to Elizabethton as the East Tennessee Railroad. Baldwin number 12 is preserved and operates on the Tweetsie Railroad in Blowing Rock, North Carolina.
Shed no tears for the Tweetsie, for she lives in our hearts forever.